Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon area. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals, and about whatever we've decided to talk about tonight. So tonight we're going to talk mostly about in-home dog training and rehabilitation. In-home dog training and rehabilitation. And my guests this evening are R.D. Drake. <laughs> R.D. Drake. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And Roman. Roman. Hello, Roman. Roman, can you do two feet? Yes, here, hop. Good boy. <laughs> Good boy. Uh, yes, say hi. Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, off. <laughs> yes. Good off. Good boy. Yeah. So we're going to do a typical show in two segments. The first segment is oh, about 20 or uh, 30 minutes where I'm talking to you about who you are so the viewers can get an idea where you're coming from when you say things. Mm -hmm. And the second segment will be uh, about the subject in-home dog training and rehabilitation. And you had a few questions you sent me, and I got carried away and had a bunch of questions to prompt you. Everybody wants to talk about dogs. <laughs> yeah. And I got some stories to tell you, too, if we have another three hours or so. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> One hour show, we're going to do it in three. <laughs> All right. So that's the bio segment. It's a who are you segment is what I call it. Now my guests and I will tell you a little about who and how we are personally. And I haven't done myself uh, my host bio summary, but I will read it to you. Uh, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, of red, white, and Roman Catholic parentage on December 26, 1928. Today I am a religious and accepting of all others. I'm a retired Ph.D. clinical psychologist and present-day television broadcast journalist. Television broadcast journalist. Try saying that fast. <laughs> I'm the 12th of 12 children and married and am the father of five daughters by first marriage. Politically, I'm a progressive populist activist still learning how to live lovingly. Still learning how to live lovingly. A few of my heroes include Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and any other fellow human who is currently living lovingly. So that's my bio summary. Now I've got to ask you some questions. There you go. All right. If I'd ask your best friend, who is R.D.? What would your best friend say? Be, be your best friend. R.D. is... Oh, my best friend's beautiful. Hang on. Let me, let me just be her for a minute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She would say R.D. is reliable as a friend. If, mm -hmm. if I say I'm going to be there, I'll be there, especially for my friends, especially for my best friend. She's probably the prettiest person I know. Just I adore her so much. And I think that's what makes me such a good friend to her is because I just want to be her friend. She's so amazing. Uh -huh. um, she recently got married, and, and my husband and I uh, were at her wedding, and we set up all the chairs for her uh wedding ceremony and then we also set up a uh, big archway for her reception and mm -hmm. then we tore it down too because you know after the wedding <laughs> people leave and you forget that you got to tear that stuff down too but it wasn't even work I, I mean she kept saying thank you thank you thank you for all this it wasn't even work I just love doing things to help my friends mm -hmm. so I think maybe she would say Artie's a helpful person helpful person all right so, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Portland, Oregon mm -hmm. in 1992. But you know what? It's been so long, I don't quite remember it. <laughs> you ready for your first uh, trick question? Oh, okay. Why were you born? Oh. You know, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. Currently... Currently struggling with that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh huh. Okay. I don't know. Yes. I don't have a real 
easy. I mean, I have a service dog for crying out loud. That's, normal people can function without a, the help of a service animal. We get all kinds of answers to that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything significant for the viewers watching about your racial, national, or cultural heritage? You know, That's everybody everybody always asks what I am. <laughs> I'm ethnically ambiguous. Am, ambiguous mm -hmm. is the word I think mm -hmm. I was looking for. Um, I get asked a lot if I'm Pacific Islander mm -hmm. or if I'm... Um, Native American, mm -hmm. I'm not anything special. <laughs> My dad is from Michigan. He's a very white man. Uh -huh. I don't know what he is, some mix of white. And then my mother was uh, black. So I'm just, just a black and white. Yes, somehow you're my distant, distant, distant cousin because I'm from New Orleans, you know. Yes, and that's you why know what, I you mentioned that. that. I do. Yeah. I've never been outside of Oregon, but this summer I'm taking a trip down to Alabama. Um, and I'm going to be stopping in New Orleans. And oh, my goodness. That's really exciting. When you stop in New Orleans, go have a poor boy sandwich. Okay. Not a poor boy, a Not poor a boy. Oh, poor boy. <laughs> Will I get made fun of if I call it a poor boy? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Probably with my accent, too, I'll get made fun of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have a religious preference? Yes, I'm Christian. Uh huh. What does that um, mean, you being Christian? That means I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is my personal Savior and the only way to heaven. That's so what it means to me. I'm a recovering Roman Catholic, so I'm a Christian too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember the Catholic school growing up and all that sort of thing, but I have pleasant memories uh, uh, along with overly strict um, teachers. Uh, enough of that for me. How about yes, you? Yes, strict rules I don't think is what... Um, I think that's really where religion goes wrong. When it, when rules become really really strict and but everybody's different and every relationship is different, right? And I tell this to my clients all the time, every dog is different and every person is different. So every relationship in the house is going to be different. And if you just imagine in that tiny little ecosystem if every relationship is different, then the in the whole entire e ecosystem of spirituality, if there's a God who is bigger than us, and he has an individual relationship with all the people on earth, every relationship is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So you can't put rules on relationships like that. Mm -hmm. Because a relationship, a rule in our relationship would be much different than a rule in maybe my husband's relationship. Mm -hmm. What's your husband's name? Gavin? Gavin Drake. Yes. He was, he was on. <laughs> yeah, he was on before. You had him on. He's delightful, yeah. He's yeah. such a sweetheart. He's really so... handsome, too. Did you have another religion earlier on, or did you always no. been Christian? Um, I was born. I was born to Christian parents, and then I was um, adopted by uh, another Christian couple. Mm -hmm. So I've been in the church all my life. Mm -hmm. You go to church regularly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned spiritual or spirituality. What does that mean? And I got a. All over the place, the answers to that. Spirituality. Yeah. I think it means believing in a bigger connection. I think it means believing, well, I say God. Other religions mm -hmm. don't always say God. But I think you can be spiritual without believing in my God. Yeah. You mentioned uh, God in, in terms of he. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be a binary or... I don't think so. Okay. I, it's just how I talk about him. <laughs> uh her. Or her. See? <laughs> but I don't think that's the point. I think getting caught up in, if, if people get caught up in arguing over that, then we're going to miss the bigger picture a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's so small. It, I think God doesn't care if you call him him or her or whatever as long as your relationship is what he's looking for. But the relationship, what kind of relationship should you have with God? Well, uh, I would imagine a good one, depending on what you believe about God, would then depend on what kind of relationship you would have. In my belief, I believe that our relationship with God should be something to better ourselves. 
we should be trying to live lovingly, like you say, mm -hmm. and we should be trying to um, strive to be honest, helpful people. Do you? I, not always, <laughs> not as much as I should. Yeah, yeah, there's always room for improvement. Huh? Yeah, it's easier to say these things yeah. <laughs> than to follow through. Okay, how about your formal education? You know what, I don't... You're homeschooled? I was homeschooled. I don't um, have a diploma. I never graduated anything. Um, I, I'm self-taught. Uh -huh. How about other education and you know, being self-taught? Or, or anything comes to mind with that? Mm, I attended... School of Hard Knocks or something? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've uh, learned lots of stuff just by living through it. Um, but I did attend a little bit of community college. Um, I don't have any degrees in anything. I don't mm -hmm. have any diplomas. Like, again, I don't even have a GED. Mm -hmm. But I run my own business, so that just goes to show. Put in some hard work and you can get anywhere. How long have you been running your business? Um, I started my business in 2017. 2017. Mm -hmm. So three years officially. So what else have you done besides training dogs? I used to work as a kennel tech in a vet's office. Um, they're the ones who carry and move all the animals. We clean the back. We keep all the animals fed and happy. We can administer uh, medications. We're not quite vet techs, but we do take a lot of responsibility and, in helping. And then I was a PE teacher and a lifeguard and a swim instructor, but I've always loved the dogs and working with the animals. So, uh, You get the special feelings for cats? I do. I have a cat. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I do. His name is Tom Cat. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's yeah. sweet. I'm, everybody who comes over to my house goes, I didn't know you had a cat because it's usually so full of dogs. <laughs> but we do have a cat. I oh. like them, too. Okay, how old is he or she? Um, he's about four this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He was a rescue from Bonnie Hayes over here in um, Hillsboro. Yeah, I know where Bonnie Hayes is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my wife, uh, Pat, uh, loves cats. And uh, we've got it mixed up here because... I love dogs. Anyhow, we, we, we're not on the same page, anyhow. Oh. But anyhow, we've talked about getting one or the other, and we didn't go anywhere beyond that. You get a dog that acts like a cat, and there you go. Slide it in both. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned your husband a, a little bit ago. I did. Uh huh. And do you have any children? No. We're, we'd like to. We like kids. Uh -huh. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, you get involved in political situations. What's your political persuasion? Are you left, right, or center? Is that a, a you know? A fair I think question? of myself as a um, a libertarian. I really don't care what the next guy does yeah, as long yeah. as he's not harming me. Mm -hmm. I I think uh, the less government, the better. Mm -hmm. And I think people are selfish, but but deep down people don't really want to hurt each other and and uh, that's my stance on that I'm not real hard right yeah uh, we were talking about spirituality a little while ago and I had something to add to that too I was thinking in terms of spiritual uh, spirituality in terms of feelings and I have years of practicing this and I think if I have a spiritual experience, it's because I am out of my head and in communication with the ether or something or God or, or whatever. And I think a teacher of mine said, if you've had a spiritual moment that lasts for a total of eight minutes in your lifetime, you've had a worthy, worthwhile experience. For example, there's a, a favorite meadow in Yellowstone and uh, I was there early one uh, spring morning, and I, it was a big rock, and I was convinced I was going to sit there on that rock and meditate. And I told my wife, keep going and come back later on, I'll be through. 
But then when I was sitting atop this rock and the sun came up and it was so beautiful and then I had something happening to me. And I don't know what it was, but it felt different. And then I thought, what's happening to me? And then I moved out of being spiritual because I was thinking. Mm. So those kinds of moments are precious yep. to experience. And you never can tell when they're going to start happening for you. No. But when I do, I'd be welcome to it and say, yes, shut this down. And that's, a, that's spiritual. That's yes. my de definition of spiritual. Yes. And you know that I find that with dogs a lot that can happen way, way more often. Like you said, you don't ever know when it's going to happen and you can't force it to happen. But this is something that I do that I don't think any other dog trainer in our area does. I schedule sessions and I charge per visit. I don't charge per hour because some dogs need more time and some dogs need less time and some owners need more time and some need less. But I can't go into a situation and just know what's going to happen because animals are such spiritual beings. They just live in the moment that they're in. And when, when I'm working with a dog or any animal, I used to work with horses too. Um, horses too. It's, it's a very spiritual, soft um, work that you have to do. You have to be in that space like you were on the rock. You have to be open and quiet. And as soon as you start trying to logically think through what's going on, it just, it, you lose the moment. You can't talk to the animal. You can't work through whatever's. I work with lots of um, anxieties. Lots of dogs in Portland have anxiety. Um, and lots of them are afraid and lots of them are anxious and uh, fearful. I said anxious and fearful and angry. Lots of them are aggressive. Are and they, you can are they only move their through. Owners? Mm, not always. Sure. Excuse not me. always. I do believe that just living as closely as everybody lives in the Portland area mm -hmm. is very stressful for animals. They, I think they were meant to have more space. Um, but it's, a, it's very spiritual work. It's very, uh, you have to be in the moment and you have to be willing to slow down. So I don't, I don't believe I'll ever charge per hour because I don't know how slow I have to go until I meet the dog. And it's more of a connection other than brain or thinking, uh, something beyond this whole human being or human yeah. being. Yeah, yeah. I always tell my clients, if we could sit them spiritual. down and talk to them, <laughs> it would be way easier. <laughs> just sit you down and go, listen, Fido, you got to stop peeing on the couch. It's just not going to work out anymore. <laughs> But we can't do that, so we got to be really, we got we to gotta move at their pace. And yeah. it's, a, it's a very spiritual thing. It's and pretty they, cool. And they can tell that you know how to do that, and you, you're letting yourself yes. have that permission. Huh? You know they can, and they do, get, they do seem to be really grateful for it, too. That when, when I come in and I start working with them, they go, oh, finally, somebody understands what I'm trying to say. Uh -huh. And it's really cool. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it's really quick. As soon as you can, as soon as you can get through that little hurdle of communicating with the dog, and they go, "Oh, you understand?" And I say, "Yes, I'm here to help you." And they go, "Oh, well, all right. What do you want me to do?" And it's so quick. And I have clients all the time go, "This is night and day." And I say, "Yeah, the dog didn't want to be bad. He just couldn't communicate." Can you see a sense of connection? between what the dog can see in your eyes and you in his or her eyes? Sometimes. Spiritual connection, if I may. Sometimes. Um, I don't tend to stare at dogs' eyes, though, because that can be a, a challenging stance. Yes. And then they can take that the wrong way. Uh -uh. <laughs> I've got, you, were, you were asking me about my tattoos. You should have asked me about my scars. Look at this. This is all dog bites. Dog really? bites, dog oh, bites. Really? Yeah, this is, I don't <laughs> stare at dogs in the eye. <laughs> I've been bitten too many times to make that mistake again. Of course, yeah. <laughs> All right. a, a sensing rather than the eye, eye contact. Okay. Uh, uh, challenging question. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? So sympathy, I believe, is feeling 
bad for someone, feeling bad that they're in a situation. Oh, that's a real terrible situation. I feel bad for you. But empathy is feeling bad with someone and taking on the situation and, and being part of it, I think. Yeah. Are you being empathetic with me right now? I try to be. <laughs> it's, it's a, you can make connections a lot quicker if you're open and honest yeah. with people. I mean, you can, make, you can make small talk with anybody. Yeah. But if you invited me here to your lovely studio, and then it would be silly for me to put up a wall. You're so easy to be friendly with. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any memberships in political or social organizations that come to mind for you? Nope. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Gavin and I are both not affiliated with anything. We, again, the, I think that goes back to the libertarian where we'll do our thing, you do yours. All right. <laughs> Any persons uh, from your early life or later life, any time that you uh, felt good about or appreciated a lot, uh, any names come to mind? Yeah. Um, the, the gal who adopted me, her name is Linnea King and her husband is Hap King. And they raised me through my teenage years, as those are some formative years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they really taught me a lot of things that my, um, my family of origin wasn't providing for me. Um, again, I was homeschooled, but uh, my birth mother was not fantastic so I I was lacking in education but I was also lacking in social training um, and then I was held back due to um, different abuses mm -hmm. so Linnea and Hap took me in that broken frustrated state and then also I was a teenager <laughs> teenagers are broken <laughs> oh. and frustrated even if they come from a great house yeah yeah um, and they really, they really helped me a lot. Um, I've struggled with uh, depression and suicidal ideation a lot in my life. I went and through they, that stage years ago. Yeah, yeah, I got through it. Thank goodness. Yeah, I mean that's that's what Roman helps me with now, but they they really kept me on track and they kept me alive. And they, I'm positive that I would have gone down a very different road without them. Okay. So I'm very grateful for, I call her my mom. I'm very grateful for my mom uh -huh. and Hap King. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is doing good? What does what that is mean? doing good? What do you think? You a good boy? You do good? <laughs> I think so. I think you do good. Oh, there's your answer too. I think, I think if animals can do good, I think it's very, very simple. I think lots of times... We try to make more complex things out of something that's really simple. Yeah. And you can just be good. You can just be with somebody, and that can be good. Or you can think of somebody, and that can be good. Um, so in, in my religion, we you know say thoughts and prayers. <laughs> so you can just think of somebody and say a prayer for them and, and wish good for them. And I think that's good. But, uh, but then there are bigger gestures you can do. You can help build somebody a house. You can help move somebody from place to place. You can let somebody live with you. I, there's lots of ways to be good. But I think good is, good can be really small too. I don't think it's necessarily measured in how big or grand or who notices. This is my favorite sign. I got a collection of these signs that I make myself do it. Being kind. That's, mm -hmm. that's being good. That's good. And accepting uh, if there's someone who flips you off on the freeway and uh, says, wave at him, hello. Yeah. <laughs> My sister and I have a game that we play when, whenever we're um, in a situation that it's like getting cut off in the freeway and it's really easy to get angry. Yeah. We talk to each other when we say, oh, he bet he's in a hurry. And they go, Maybe his wife's having a baby and he has to get there quick. Or we say, maybe he forgot his wallet and he has to go home and get gas before he, before he um, 
gets to work. You really do that sometimes? <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. That's a game my sister and I play to, to keep ourselves in an unoffendable mindset. <laughs> okay. So let's take a break here for a few minutes, and then we'll come back and start talking about training and that sort of thing, okay? And thanks for staying tuned. And for your viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals, and about what we've decided to talk about tonight. And tonight we're talking about in home dog training and rehabilitation. In home dog training and rehabilitation. And now we're going to start talking about that. Okay. <laughs> now, you sent me a few questions, and I was waiting for those, and I wrote some questions out here to you from the top of my head to ask you about Wonderful. dog training because I, I've always loved dogs, as you can tell. So They are great. Shall I start with my questions? Let's do it. What is dog training? Some it's, people have um, no idea what it is. Um, dog training is when, you're, when you need to change the behavior of the dog, whether it's walking looser on the leash so the dog's not pulling as hard, or whether you're trying to get your dog and cat to get along in the same living space. To get along together, dog and cat? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do that? Oh, easy. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, I think you're going to have to get two. <laughs> one dog, one cat. Okay. Uh, um, there's lots of dog there's lots of different things to train with your dog you can also just do trick training um, here with us today we have Roman who's been trained as a service dog and he works specifically for me but he's in a medical alert dog what's a service dog generally a service dog is a dog specifically task trained to mitigate an illness for one person so it's very different than a therapy dog who is trained to provide therapy to lots of people, usually not their handler. Um, they go into libraries and let the kids read to them or they go and visit patients in the hospital. And an emotional support dog or an ESA is a dog that is prescribed by a doctor to live with somebody, but they're really just glorified pets. An ESA is not a service dog. A service dog has a much, um, a much bigger task, a much bigger job than an ESA, because an ESA doesn't have to have any kind of special training, and a service dog has to be, we call it public access trained. They have to be trained to deal with the stresses of going through a place like the mall or um, in a restaurant, in a crowded restaurant. They, sh they should be not seen or heard. It's very, very often that a service dog will be under a table doing their own job and will leave the restaurant and, and the waiters go, oh, you had a dog in here this whole time? They should be very quiet. They shouldn't sit on the table. They shouldn't eat food. If you ever see somebody saying, oh, this is my service dog, and they're giving them french fries, it's, oh, it's probably not really a service dog. <laughs> Are all breeds trainable all breeds of dog trainable all of them you know in my personal opinion yeah the only dog that I would never train is a wolf hybrid mm. that's the only breed that I don't think I don't think uh, you can train a wolf hybrid because of genetic makeup yeah I think it's a wolf I think uh. at that point it's a wolf uh -huh. so just get yourself a, a dog with sticky up ears and you're good. <laughs> you don't need a wolf. But other than that, yes, I think all domesticated breeds can be trained. Hmm. What is in-home training compared to other training? So I 
I only do in-home training where I go to the dog's environment and the dog's most often walked paths. So typically I work in the dog's neighborhood or the dog's um, the dog park that they typically go to because dogs can associate places, they can associate people, places and things. So if the dog park means excitement and energy, every time we go to the dog park the dog's going to be excitable. And if a training facility means obedience and paying attention, every time you take your dog to the training facility, he'll pay attention and he'll be a really good boy and then you go home and he stops listening. So I do in-home training because I don't want them to only be trainable at the training facility or at the dog training class. Sure. I want them to be able to transfer everything we're working on to home. And it makes more sense to me to do it in the home with the people they live with. Um, I've often trained families that have kids too, and the parents will say, well, should we send the kids out? And I say, no, because the dog lives with the kids. So we have to teach the dog how to behave around the kids. We have to teach the kids not to jump up on the couch and have the dog jump up on the couch, right? In, in their environment, we can teach them what, what we want them to do. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's the, that's the biggest difference is there's lots of classes and lots of facilities, but I don't think it always translates in the dog's brain. We mentioned that before the show started uh, a few words about why you became a dog trainer. Mm -hmm. Will you say a few words about that? Why you, yeah. did you become what you are? So um, I was homeschooled as a little girl and I spent as much time as possible at the local shelter because I love dogs <laughs> and I just wanted to pet all the dogs. And um, the folks there saw me showing up all the time. I think I was 12 years old and they said, do you want to work here? <laughs> so I volunteered cleaning kennels and folding laundry and the dog trainers who worked in conjunction with the shelter said I could take any dog training class I wanted to if I trained a shelter dog because they're easier to adopt when they have some basic manners. Uh -huh. So from the ages of 12 to 15 I trained all different breeds and temperaments and ages and sizes of dogs and I just kept showing up and I kept training dogs and I just loved doing it. And the more you practice something, the better you get at it. So, mm -hmm. so now I do this. How about other trainers? Do they recognize you as being a, a legitimate, because you're young, a legitimate trainer? You know, I do. So he, here's something we say in the dog training world, is that uh, you ask any two dog trainers about something, and the only thing they'll agree on is that the third dog trainer doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so there are definitely trainers who are my good friends and who will work with me and teach me more things and and there are trainers who disagree with me but see that I do have a heart for the animals and I know what I'm doing. A heart for the animals. And then there are some trainers I think who probably don't like me but they don't talk to me so it doesn't bother me. Humans. <laughs> Stinky. When I come back I'm going to come back as a bonobo. There you go. You know what the bonobo is? <laughs> yeah, a monkey. <laughs> so, so, boy, you were on top of things, aren't you? I love yeah. animals, Don. You didn't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Don, I do know a lot about animals. <laughs> what characteristics make a good dog trainer? And do you have them, those characteristics, human characteristics that make you a good dog trainer? I can always get better. You can always get better. Yeah. Um, I do think I'm better with dogs than with people. Um, but I, I think a good dog trainer has to be patient. You have to, you have to wait for the dog to get it, to understand whatever you're trying to teach them. Um, and you have to be able to understand the psychology of the dog, which is very different than the psychology of a human. Hmm? How so? Well, dogs, dogs live very much in a, in a black and white existence. So there has to be correction. And then there can be also praise and reward. You can't just have praise and reward if you're training a dog. But with a human, with a child, you could, you could live on praise and reward with minor correction. Sure. Um, but with a dog, 
they correct each other from from the day one. Mom is correcting puppies as soon as they do something wrong. Mm -hmm. She doesn't care how old they are. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> dogs right. really, they do appreciate correction differently than humans do. Humans can get very offended and they can get very defensive mm -hmm. when you correct them. Mm -hmm. And dogs don't. They go, oh, I didn't know you didn't like that. Okay. And they don't do it. <laughs> they really do appreciate correction differently than we do. And that's, that's the biggest difference in, the, in dog psychology versus human psychology. Uh -huh. Dogs can also just live. They are just, they're amazing spiritual animals, but they can really appreciate the earth and movement much easier than humans can. When does a dog need rehabilitation? <laughs> a dog needs to be rehabilitated when he's no longer allowed to be a dog. There are so many dogs who are human children substitutes, and they're not allowed to just be a dog. But also I've seen in the service dog community, there's dogs who are expected to be medical equipment, and they're not allowed to be a dog. And there's dogs that are expected to like I said, replace a child. Maybe somebody doesn't have a baby, so they, they want to spoil their dog. And when their dog isn't allowed to just be the animal that it was created to be, yeah. then you need to rehabilitate it. That's where lots of anxiety and aggression and frustration uh -huh. comes from. Just be a dog. Let them be a dog. Uh, maybe I made a mistake along the way here, but you can go back and be a dog. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, do you prefer simple dog training or rehabilitation training? Is there a difference? There, there is. So the dog training that I do in home is, is really fun when the owners start to understand the dog psychology, and then they can communicate and with their dog the on their own. you're training the owner too, aren't you? Very often. <laughs> Very often I'm just showing the owners what they need to do, how they can better communicate with their dog. The rehab I do at my place. So the rehab is when a trainer has a dog who's too difficult f to handle on their own. So I'll take the dog home with me and I'll do a month of rehabilitation and then return the dog to the owner. And both of them are really satisfying. I love when owners get it. I love when they jump on board and is they're training their own dog. Is that when you get these scars dog. because you rehabilita rehabilitated Yes, dogs. I have, um, there was a big black lab who was terribly, terribly food aggressive. And I was working with him and he was, oh, he was doing so good and I was holding the bowl for him and he was just eating out of the bowl while I was there. And I turned to see another dog who was approaching us and I was gonna shoo that dog away to give this dog time to eat his food. Yeah. And he didn't like the movement and he, and he chewed up my arm like a corn cob. <laughs> but um, did, yeah, you, so the dogs come and they stay with me and we work through whatever issue they have and, and they're retrained how to be a dog and how to be accepting and how to be calm and just appreciate the moment that they're in. And, and they're, they don't have to be afraid anymore. He doesn't have to be afraid that somebody's gonna steal his food. And then, then they can go home again. <laughs> yeah. And that's always really nice because the turnaround is so drastic. Dogs are always ready to live a simpler life. It's so stressful yeah. to be angry or afraid. It's very stressful. Yeah. So it, when you can show an animal or a human a better way of living and say, look, you could just, you could just be kind. You could just be helpful. Yeah. You, could, you don't have to be stressed. They go, oh, that's so much nicer. <laughs> I don't want to be stressed. Thank you for showing me that. And dogs are they're so ready to turn around as soon as you tell them that. Mm -hmm. Now, may I tell you about Rocky? I would love to hear about Rocky. Dog. Yes, please. Well, after I put these questions together, I have a, my, a daughter in Southern California, and I talk to her fairly often other daughters too, but uh, I was reading these questions off to her on the phone, and this was just yesterday, and I got to this story about Rocky, my very first dog, and I was telling the story, and I got 
feeling how I was when I was 11 years old. He was mm -hmm. my very first dog, and he was a mongrel. And uh, I had an appendectomy, and when I came home from Charity Hospital, uh, Rocky missed me for a few days, and uh, he just hung out under my bed, under my chair, whatever, as I was still recovering from the surgery. And he, he oh, I loved him, I just loved him, oh man. And then uh, something happened. And I think the neighbor next door was mean to him. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, but anyhow, uh, he became a, uh, rabid, rabies, and the foaming at the mouth and the whole mm. thing. And it was in New Orleans, and the side yard was muddy and like that, and he was biting at the fence as our yard was separating the neighbor's yard. And, and uh, I went down in, in the, and still recovering from the surgery and laid down in the mud with him. And uh, he was uh, attempting to bite me, but he pulled back. And, and then he stopped about the third time and he took off. He just ran away? Yes, the last I saw him. And I think he knew he was going to bite me. And uh, as I was reading this, say, talked to my daughter about Rocky. I'd never told her about Rocky before. I, all the feelings came back because we were laying in the mud in the rain, and Rocky was foaming at the mouth, and I could tell, I could tell, I knew he was going to bite me, but I, I stared there with him. I'm repeating myself. It's an important it's, story. It's an amazing story. They are amazing animals. And they, it's true. Is it's it, so true. Is it it's possible beautiful. that he could have sensed that he was going to harm me? Yeah, and he didn't want to. And he loved you so much that he would rather run away and keep you safe. That's amazing. Sounds like he was such a sweet boy. And that was many, many years ago. Yeah. yeah. And you remember a thing like that. You don't forget a thing like yeah. that. Yeah. So I was thinking about you and what we're going to do, and then that, that, that memory came back. But anyhow, so much for that. And do you own your own personal dogs? Uh, yes. Well, we know that. We got yes. an answer to that. Cause we got Roman. <laughs> and Roman has a wife at home. Her name is Revy. Uh huh. And, um,. Then we also have a little, a small little dog named Dot Dot, who is uh, Gavin's dog. I have two <laughs> Dobermans, and he's got a little tiny dog. <laughs> and they all get along? They do. They uh -huh. get along well. My little dog doesn't like Revy so much. Um, I think she likes Roman a lot and is jealous that Roman married Revy. I think that's, I think she's jealous. <laughs> Um, how about a typical dog client and owner? Any, mm -hmm. Anything stands out about a typical uh, client uh, uh, also different? They're all so different. Okay. Every relationship is different. Every dog is different and every human is different. So every relationship is different. It's always amazing to see. Typically, though, I can tell you if I go into a house and there's more than one person living in the house, they have different issues with the dogs <laughs> because I hear you. I know. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've had a migraine this whole time, and so he's oh. telling me that we need to go lay down. <laughs> he's doing a really good job. Uh -huh. um, We're almost so, doing about 10 minutes. Oh, away. oh, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. You're, you're doing good, and I hear you. Um, typically, though, one person will say, the dog pulls really bad on the leash, and another person will say, no, I don't have any problems with the dog walking on the leash. And that's just because every relationship is different. Yeah, so yeah. the only thing I can tell you is typically there's nothing similar. <laughs> Very and we good. have to work yeah. on each relationship separate. How about an especially challenging dog client? You, you think anyone comes to mind besides the one that was chewing on your arm? <laughs> Oh, I've been bitten by quite a few of them. Um, really? When I was a little girl, I chased, a, I chased a dog for two hours all over our neighborhood. And I finally cornered him in somebody's backyard, and I, I grabbed his collar, and he bit my hand, and that's here, these two biggest scars here. Yeah. And um, 
then I took him home and I named him Gray and I gave him some food and some water. <laughs> um, but I remember walking home with blood on my hand dripping onto him and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm getting you bloody man. <laughs> we just walked, I just walked him home. He didn't mean to bite me, he was just scared. Um, he was just scared. He was just scared. But a, a very, I can't always save all the dogs. I don't have a 100% record and that's that's the most challenging that's the ones that really tear me up is is dogs that i couldn't rehabilitate and they were just too dangerous and um had to be put down those are really there are some like that huh? yeah i still beat myself up about those ones sometimes they were just too far gone and i couldn't get to them soon enough sometimes their situation was too um inappropriate uh -huh. I was watching television, and the president, President Trump, had a, a, a dog that was a, in the Middle East and, and took out a, a, an enemy, and he was uh, giving a commendation to the dog. It was a big celebration like that. Yeah. But I wonder, any uh, service dogs, those kind of service dogs who were in combat like that, if you have to retrain them to go back into ordinary civilian life? Um, typically, I think that military dogs are military first dogs. offered to their handlers. Yeah. So um, if when they do retire, they're first offered to their handlers, mm -hmm. and then they go through um, some evaluations to see if they're, um, if they're mm -hmm. able to be adopted by citizens, civilians. Okay. Um, but... Sometimes, sometimes they're not, and in those I cases, I believe they live in that. the kennels. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they are taken care of. Uh huh. Okay. They're treated well. Uh, how about an especially easy dog client? <laughs> yes. Some dogs are just really, really smart, and they're really sweet, and we click so easily. Um, I, I love Australian Shepherds. They're some of my favorite dogs. And one of my very favorite clients is a Australian Shepherd who visits all the time. And I've made it my mission that every time he visits, I'm gonna teach him a brand new trick and send him home with a new trick. And we've so far kept our promise. And every time he comes to visit, I teach him a whole new trick. He's such a smart boy and he's so sweet and he's ready to work. He likes snacks. So How? it's easy to teach him a new trick if I just have enough cheese. <laughs> How old is he? Mm, I think About he's three. Three, young. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you manage separating from an easy dog client? I've asked you this before, but the camera started rolling. Yeah, I. it's the same, easy or difficult. Um, I have always known that I'm watching other people's dogs, and I'm proud and happy to give them back to their owners. Uh -huh. So we used to foster dogs as well um, when we would keep the dogs until they found a home, but they were homeless. So we, there's, in the foster community, they call them foster fails because lots of people love the dogs so much and just want to keep them and don't want to give them up. But I've always seen it like I'm just, I'm pet sitting. I'm watching somebody else's dog. And I'm, I'm happy to train them, and I'm happy to work with them, and I'm so happy for them to go home because I know their family loves them, too. Oh, very good, very good. Yeah. If you had it to do all over again, would you choose a different profession? I would be a cowboy. A cowboy? I would be a cowboy. You're a girl. You can be a cowboy. <laughs> that's, that's true. Okay, is it? Cowboy is a profession? <laughs> yeah. I would be a cowboy. I would be a ranch hand. And I would work with my dogs and moving cattle. That's what I would do uh -huh. over in uh, Pendleton, Oregon. What do you think of Labrador Retrievers? They're pretty sweet dogs. Actually, I think Labs are 50-50. Are you either get just a sweetheart who's, who, you know, just wants to please you and do whatever you say, or you get this maniac dog <laughs> who you can't run far enough. <laughs> There's the, All the labs I've met have either been, oh, this is just a couch potato wonderful dog, or holy cow, somebody take that dog outside. <laughs> it's nuts. Uh -huh. So um, 
They are pretty popular, though. Lots of people like labs. Yeah. Lots of people are scared of Dobermans, and lots of people like labs. But it was a lab that chewed me up, and it's a Doberman that works for me. So. What about pit to show bulls? You, you know, I've had some some really bad experience with pit bulls. But again, I've had met some really cuties, and they look like little pigs, and you just squeeze their cheeks. <laughs> oh my goodness! So you got to you got to take it in stride. I think you got to take it in stride. Um, mm -hmm. I never get to meet the nice dogs because I'm called in as a dog trainer for a <laughs> bad behavior, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have some clients with some really, really sweet pit bulls. But then, again, there have been some dogs that I've been unable to help, and they are just too dangerous. Pit bulls are a very, very strong breed. Mm -hmm. And they do have, they are, do have a genetic disposition to become animal These aggressive. Powerful jaws, man. They're very strong dogs. They're very muscular and they were bred specifically to fight. So yeah. you can't you can't outrun genetics in any direction. Right. Yep. Poodles are made to swim, labs are made to retrieve, pit bulls were made to fight, and dobermans were made to protect. Dobermans can become very territorial. So it's all it's in genetics. You got you have to take into account what the breed was originated for. Yes. Do you know Pomeranians used to be a 40-pound sled dog? No. Yes, they were a Spitz hound, and they were 40 pounds uh, generally. They could be bigger or smaller. Um, and they were like a husky dog. They were a working dog. They were a sled dog. Mm -hmm. And um, Queen, Queen Victoria, I believe, took like a real fascination to them. And she bred the smallest ones together. And that's, she shrunk the dog 20 pounds in her lifetime, in just her own breeding yes, kennels. Yes, uh -huh. But that's why Pomeranians are so feisty. They're, it's basically a husky. He just wants to go. He wants to do something. And we go, just settle down. Just sit on the couch. And he goes, what? <laughs> I was bred to pull carts. <laughs> Not anymore. You're only two pounds. What can you do now? Any, uh, Genetics. Yeah. Any other dog stories from your experience uh, that you know about or experienced or heard about that, that are worth telling the viewers? Hmm. You know, I'm always amazed by the stories of, the, of dogs who travel so far to find their homes. Yeah. Again. You got some of those? Or one <laughs> of those at least? I don't have, no, I don't have one that you could look up and find, but I've heard of just I, amazing like people uh, got in a car crash and the dog was thrown from the car and they couldn't find him because he'd broken his leg and um, and they left but they were just traveling through the state yeah. and the dog found them again years yeah, later. I've heard those stories those are they're unbelievable aren't they? like across country. Yeah. Dogs are amazing and they're so loyal and they we don't deserve dogs. But they're talk so about sensing. Yeah. So, never mind. What, what <laughs> amazes me now when I'm riding in a car and I'm seeing a dog in a truck mm -hmm. or, or, or even a, a car with a window open and his, his nose is out there and he's smelling and I says, my God, he's getting confused. He can't tell what the hell to focus on. <laughs> I think he's just enjoying it. I think when a dog hangs out the window and he's sniffing the air, it's like us looking at a painting. Really? Yeah, I don't think you get, like, you could look at the whole painting and go, oh, this is what it is. But you could also look in real close and see the brush strokes and, and find all those little details and get lost in that, too. And I think dogs can go, yes, I'm in Oregon. But then they can also sniff smaller and smaller details. And but I think they can, they can really enjoy it. What's the, what? <laughs> Maybe they just seem like that. I think they're a lot smarter than, than we give them credit for. Mm-hmm. We mentioned earlier about uh, dogs that there are memorials set up for them because they refuse to believe that their owner has passed away. Yeah. And I was remembering a, a story I read about a dog in England, and I think you were talking about a dog in, in Japan or mm -hmm. China. Well, this dog, he, he, when his owner was alive, they would meet at this one 
corner or something, and then he would accompany uh, the mailman. He'd accompany the mailman on his ship. And then he did this for years and years, and then the, uh, the owner passed. Mm -hmm. And the dog was sitting on that corner, rain or shine, and he was just waiting for his owner to return. Mm -hmm. And the townspeople decided, we're going to make a statue and have a memorial for the dog. Yeah. To, to memorialize the, the love and the loyalty. Yeah, they are loyalty. amazing. Loyalty. And they do, they know when somebody's missing. They know when somebody's passed. Dogs, dogs miss their dog friends <laughs> when they've passed. Do you know I'm friendly? Are you huh? like Don? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I can see it in your eyes. I'm, I don't look in the eyes too close anymore. So I've learned something with you. So anyhow, it's time for us to say goodbye. So, oh boy, I'm so glad you came aboard. So, thank you. Thank you so it was good much. It's been you. delightful. And look in the camera and say something to the viewers about anything we talked about, anything else, your okay. message. Wonderful. Hello, viewers. My, um, I would like to leave you with my biggest statement I like to tell all my clients, I always say, don't be afraid to ask questions because everybody's working on something and you can't compare yourself or your dog to anybody else or their dog because it doesn't happen overnight and keep at it. Everybody's working on something. Rump, get over here. Even we're always working on something. <laughs> okay, it looks like it's going to be time to say goodnight. So before we say, oh, Thanks for watching, and remember KFC, and uh, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC. Dr. Don, kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too, and you too. You too, buddy. And you too. Thank you, and see you next time. <laughs>